Welcome back, friends, to another episode of The Hopeful Majority. Happy Monday. It's three days before Thanksgiving, so you know what we've got to talk about. We've got an election that just happened. People are going back to their homes. And I've been on the road for the last few weeks, and people have been asking me, how do you actually have political conversations with family members that we disagree with? Which sounds like a simple topic, but it's something that a lot of us deal with. So today's going to be a much more tactical episode. Three things, three tips on how to handle political conversations at Thanksgiving. The Hopeful Majority comes at you every Monday, YouTube, Spotify, Apple, wherever you get your content. I'm sorry to miss you last week. We've been on the road since the election because our college and high school students across the country are hosting dialogues on very, very important topics like Israel-Palestine. And guess what? We just had one at Columbia University, which will be coming to the podcast soon. I'm going to talk about that because I know a lot of people are interested in that. But for this episode, you're going back home for Thanksgiving. Or if you're staying with your friends, you're doing a Friendsgiving. How do we talk politics at Thanksgiving? Let's get into the hope for majority. Three tips on how to handle political conversations at Thanksgiving. Now, I was actually originally thinking about calling this how to survive conversations at Thanksgiving, but I think we got to flip the frame. I don't think it's about survival. I think these conversations can actually be really useful. I think they could be enriching. The outrage industrial complex out there, the media tells us that there is no chance of us being able to have conversations with people that are different than us. How many of us have heard that, right? Well, I think it's a little different. So three tips. Tip number one, what is the goal of the conversation? Most of us go into conversations these days with our friends, with our family members, with our colleagues, work people, et cetera with the intention to win the argument, right? You got to win the argument. But I've got a different concept for you. I don't think the goal of the conversation should be to win the argument, nor should the goal of the conversation be to change somebody's mind, because I'm sorry to tell it to you, but in 15 minute conversations, you're not going to change anybody's mind. And that's from the dialogue nerd here. So what should actually be the goal of the conversation? And the reason I think the goal is important is because if we can orient ourselves to understand what success looks like, then I think we feel a little less hopeless about the outcome because usually the outcome is a stalemate. Usually the outcome is someone leaves frustrated. So let's actually tackle how do you have the conversation with the objective and there's a new objective. And the goal of that should be how to actually understand why the person that you're talking to believes what they believe. The goal should not be to win or change people's minds. The goal of a conversation should be to understand why. Now you're saying, Manu, what does understanding why my uncle believes in, let's say, President Trump's policies or my aunt believes in Kamala Harris's policy. What? Why does that help? Well, here's the thing. Right now, we operate in an environment where we don't actually understand why people believe what they believe. We, we forget that there's a lot of lived experiences that contribute to the way that people consume information. Um, why does somebody believe certain position on a certain policy issue? Um, let's understand the media they consume. Let's understand the people that they talk to. When you can start to understand the values, for example, that motivate someone's understanding of a, poli a political position, suddenly what happens is you can actually start to get somewhere. Because if you can get to people's why, you can get to the core of why they believe what they believe. And when you get to that core, suddenly the conversation changes because there's a lot of actually commonality in our whys. We have family members. We have people that we know that are vulnerable to certain issues. We've got experiences in our lives that have contributed to our understanding of something. The, the key is why gets to the core of our humanity. And if you can start to understand somebody's why, you can actually start to get somewhere. Now, you're probably wondering, well, what are some questions that I can ask, that I can engage in, that will help me understand someone's why? Here's tip number two. Ask questions not about people's policy positions, but about how they got there. Here are two examples of questions. Tell me more. Tell me why. How did you come to that specific argument? Now, you might say, well, that conversation or question will not help me win the argument, but that's the point. The goal of this conversation, the goal when we go back to our family should not be to win. The goal should be to understand because that's how we create progress. Now, you might be wondering, well, how does a question like tell me more, tell me why, tell me how, how does that help? Well, my friend Monica Guzman, and you can go back to previous episodes where we've had her on. She's an amazing, amazing author and writer on the question of curiosity. And she wrote a book called I Have Never Thought About It That Way. And it's about how she managed conversations with her family members and her parents specifically who hold different views than herself. Now, asking the question, tell me more, tell me why, what it suddenly does is it makes the other person realize that you're not actually attacking, you're curious. 
And you know one thing that people love to do is they love to talk about themselves. Trust me, I know, I host this thing, right? People love to talk about themselves. And when someone feels like, oh my God, my daughter, my son, my brother, my sister, they're actually interested in what I have to say, the ball game changes. The ball game changes because then when they feel heard, when they feel valued, everyone wants to feel heard, people. Everyone wants to feel understood. So when people understand and suddenly realize, oh my God, Manu actually wants to understand why I think the way I do on this specific issue, it changes the game. And then you can reciprocate by explaining, well, here's why I think what I think. And suddenly the issue goes not from do we believe yes on gun control or no on gun control? Or do we believe in an open border or closed border? Which, by the way, you should watch previous episodes because we also tackle the misconceptions around those policy issues. But let's say instead of those hot button issues where both you and I know the words that different political parties operate on and the ways in which they engage on, when we realize that, um, suddenly we can go beyond the tribalism of the moment. If we're having a discussion on the border, right, and the, the questions stay at the level of, President Trump believes this, President Kamala Harris believes, Vice President Kamala Harris believes this, Joe Biden believes this, Chuck Schumer believes this, my relative believes this. Um, you stay at the level, the top level of yes, no policy. My proposition is let's go layer deeper. I'll give you a very tangible example. Uh, one of our chapters three years ago, they're in a border state and they wanted to talk about immigration. This was during President Trump's peak sort of deportation policy. And there was a young woman, the topic was DACA, which is basically an immigration status provided to young people that are, are born uh, in a different country, but are brought here. And they've grown up in the United States from, you know, a very young age. So this young woman stands up and she starts talking about how she's fundamentally fearful about her existence in the United States because her status might get stripped, right? A very deep conversation motivated and driven by fear. So next young man with a Trump hat, right? We're like, uh oh, um, we don't know where this conversation is going to go stands up. And he discusses why he believes in President Trump's policies, but specifically because because we asked the question, tell me more, right? He got to the level of explaining that his family was from the El Paso region in Texas, where their their farm and their neighbors have been ravaged by crime as a result of illegal migrants, and that he was also operating from a point of fear. Now, if this young woman and this young man had kept the conversation the way our current political conversations operate without going a layer deeper. They would have stayed at that level of disagreement, but suddenly they realized we've got a common value driving both of our views. It's fear. So instead of letting the people out there play us, let's actually try to understand, well, let me, let me understand a little bit more about why you're scared, right? Maybe this young woman doesn't believe in open borders, and maybe she doesn't believe in, in a crazy immigration policy, but she's just concerned about making sure that she lives in an environment that she's known for her entire life. Or maybe this young man isn't a xenophobe, but perhaps he's just concerned because of his family's experience. You see what that does? It, it gets to a level of humanity. And here's part three. Every Bridge USA conversation, right? Every Bridge USA conversation that we have with our college and high school student chapters starts off with four norms. And I think it's very important to set the norms at the start of a conversation, because if you can set the norms and you can set the goal, right, that we talked about, the goal is not to win this argument, my friend, my uncle, the goal is to understand why, combine that with norms, suddenly you change the tenor of the conversation. So what are four norms that our chapter leaders deploy across the country that helps them have very, very productive conversation? Norm number one, listen to listen, not to respond. Norm number two, attack the argument, not the person. Attack the argument, not the person. Norm number three, this one sounds simple, but it needs it needs saying, don't have side conversations or talk while other people are talking. And norm number four, which we've gotten some critique for, but I think has really laid the foundation for productive conversations is we as people in this moment represent only ourselves and not broader social groups. Suddenly what that does, right, is when you're listening to listen rather than to respond, you're only responding to the person's argument, not their identity. And you are making sure that both people are not representing broad social groups, but just themselves. For example, I do not represent all Indian Americans in America. I only represent Manu Mil. It grounds the conversation away from the level of politics to the level of humanity. And here's my belief. My belief is that 
it's it's not that we're all united around policy issues. We'll always be divided. That's actually important. We need disagreement. My belief is that at this moment of extreme division and intolerance, people are looking to be heard. And when people are looking to be heard, they want to be reciprocated with an open hand, not the closed fist. They want to feel like they can say what's on their mind, not to normalize or excuse their viewpoints, but so that we can actually start to chip away at the fact that there's a lot of nuance to who we are. You know, there's a lot of nuance to our identities. One thing that was clear during this election was that we're not in rigid boxes of of identity markers and and of lived experiences, but we're complex beings with pain and love and success and hardship and obstacles. And the goal of these conversations at Thanksgiving should be, let's get to the complexity of who we are as people. Now, you're saying at the end, you're saying, oh, Manu, how can I have this conversation if they operate on a different set of facts? Or you're asking, yeah, but I really don't like the argument. I don't have any interest in talking to my uncle if he says this thing. Well, let me tell you something. Ask yourself, what happens if we don't have the conversation? What happens if we don't? I want you to hang on that for a quick second. What happens if we don't? Last week, we talked about a very important phrase that I'm throwing around and trying to pressure test, and that's the frame, the misinformation of intention. Not the misinformation of facts, the misinformation of intention. We live in a moment where we've convinced ourselves that the worst caricatures of the other side define everybody on the other side. And here's the thing, whether you operate on a different set of facts or not, facts don't change people's minds. Facts don't change people's minds. That is psychologically backed by research from people like Adam Grant out of University of Pennsylvania. What changes people's minds or gets them to the table is feeling like you understand who they are, what motivates them, what drives them. Importantly, you've given them the capacity to be able to externalize their views, not to be excused, but to be understood. Because when people start to feel understood, their guard drops. And when their guard drops, we create the possibility for actual progress. This Thanksgiving can be different, people. It doesn't have to be miserable. It doesn't have to be terrible. I know from past years, a lot of people send us feedback. They say, I don't know how to talk to my uncle, my brother, my sister, my cousin. Hopefully this helped you. Three tips on how to have not just productive, but transformative conversations on Thanksgiving. This is not about surviving your Thanksgiving conversation it's about thriving during it. I hope you have a wonderful, wonderful Thanksgiving, whether it's with friends, family. If you're by yourself, I hope you treat yourself. I hope you take a rest because next year, the hopeful majority is going to continue building. You're going to be doing great things in your lives. And I hope we can build this majority of people that are driven not by some kumbaya unity or by extreme disagreement or intolerance, but a desire to have the open mind. And if you appreciated that, Every Monday, YouTube, Spotify, Apple, wherever you get your content, please support the show because that's how we build the hopeful majority. I'll see you next week.